fuel rise. We'll have Hello, the yeah. oh, and we have Supervisor Watson on the phone. Supervisor Good Watson. Morning. How's, how's okay. the chairman this morning? Okay. All right. We'll have the invocation led by Joy Supervisor Brotherton, and then the pledge led by Supervisor Moss. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with grateful hearts for all that you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for this great county of Mojave. We thank you for all that you've done for all of us here. And we ask that you give us wisdom in making decisions for the for the people in this county and what best serves them. We ask you to guide us and direct us into all truth. And for that, we'll give you the praise. Amen. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I need a motion to call for an executive session to be held on February 3rd, 2014 at 9, 9 a.m. for discussion and consultation with legal counsel in accordance with ARS 38-431.03. Uh, so made. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Are there any committee and or legislative reports? Supervisor Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, is somebody going to cover the CSA LPC meeting or not? I can do it. Okay. Um, at a meeting last week, which discussed some issues pertaining to Mojave County, they went over the final recommendation from the state's countywide fire district committee, in which they set out to establish if going to a countywide fire district over what's in place would be a better option. They adopted three requirements that all fire district boards would be mandated to a five member board, that they would find a way to ease the process of districts consolidating and there could be no family members of fire personnel on the board. They discussed the underground storage tank study committee in which they set out to see if the tax for underground storage cleanup is still necessary. The original intent of the underground storage tank tax was to relieve the financial burden on gas companies to clean up their tanks. This tax is set to expire in 2015. The committee was set up to see if the tax should go away. Last year, a bill was passed that Representative Fan introduced that stated when the underground storage tank fund was completely funded that any excess funds would uh, go into the highway fund. This committee did not come to a consensus on it. No recommendation was given. House Bill 2013, County's Flood Control District Rules, has been introduced again. This bill was killed last year and if passed would put strict restrictions on our flood control districts. A vote was taken by the LPC membership to oppose this bill again. Uh, also, I attended my Energy, Environment, and Land Use Committee for NACO. Uh, the program director, Kathy Noshine, from NACO uh, talked over Resilient Counties Initiative by talking to us about what the initiative is and what topics are associated with the initiative. The initiative came about because NACO President Linda Langstrom uh, is focusing her term as president on strengthening the resilience of, na of the nation's counties in order to remain healthy, vibrant, safe, economically competitive. America's counties must be able to adapt uh, to all types of changes. Through the Resilient Counties Initiative, NACO will work with counties and their stakeholders to bolster their ability to thrive and change physically, socially, and economic conditions. President Langston was in the middle of the 2008 flood that spread through her county. From this experience, she feels it's important that all counties are able to adapt to all kinds of change and are able to get ahead of the curve in the face of this act disaster. I also participated in Congresswoman Kirkpatrick's conference call on PILT. Um, PILT was, uh, was not included in the omnibus bill, so she has introduced legislation to make PILT a permanent mandatory spending item, meaning it would not be subject to appropriations or sequesters. Introducing it was the first step, and they hope to merge it with Land Water Conservation Fund bill in order to gain support from environmentalists and other key players. They have not yet figured out how PILT is going to be funded, but they said they would like to go get to that later. They're looking for offsets. She also mentioned during one of the calls that the Water Resources Development Act is also in conference committee and will result in 15,200 jobs for Arizona if passed. MAP 21 hearings have started. They're looking at doing a five-year continuation bill. Counties and cities will have to continue to work with ADOT in order to come up with projects to send to Congress for, for funding. Um, I did travel to D.C. to meet with our 
with the other state association presidents and executive directors and the National Association of County staff and officers. And it was a time to share ideas, get support for our issues, and learn what is working in other states. Idaho and Indiana tackled tax reform and spoke of approaches with governors and state legislatures. Transportation is a major problem shared by all states, and ideas for extending our dollars was discussed. We went over understanding the federal political and policy landscape, discussing the many variances and power struggles of the political makeup that have a huge effect on our counties. What NACO can do to assist us was discussed along with pending changes to the election process at NACO. Uh, NACO President Linda Langstrom met with us and shared her thoughts on getting NACO's resolutions into the congressional debate. Richard Wolf, a reporter with USA Today, spoke to us at the press club <clears throat> dinner. Wolf currently covers the Supreme Court and has covered the White House and Congress. I travel with <clears throat> Arizona Association of County's Executive Directors, Jennifer Marston, and we split some of the activities for better use of our time. Uh, Director Marson covered the White House tour and briefing while I had meetings with congressional staff members. I had meetings with not only our state delegation and staff, but State Pre or Senate President Reed and Speaker Boehner's office. I discussed our concerns and those of our state at the state level legislation to include certain of our sheriff's posse members in death coverage that had been overlooked and for forest restoration initiative. The initiative has been stalled in implementation by red tape. And if we do not get it, more thinning of our forests complete in Arizona, we will continue to see the disastrous fire that has been plaguing us, continue to plague us. Our senators Flake and McCain introduced the Stewardship Contracting Reauthorization and Implement Act. It's a Senate Bill 1300, which will extend federal agencies' authority to enter into four stewardship contracts that would help them reduce wildfire risk. I received all-out support from Senators McCain and Flake, Congressman Gosar, Salmon, Frank, Swiker, Gahalva, Kirkpatrick for funding of our PILT, along with Senator Reed and, and uh, Congressman Boehner. I shared our resolution on funding for PILT, and they are taking a serious look at it. Upon returning uh, to Arizona, Speaker Boehner's office contacted uh, me for personal stories on how the elimination of PILT would affect counties. I shared some of our counties um, could be forced into bankruptcy and gave them examples. His request fell at the same time of the Lake Havasu Metropolitan Planning Organization. And since I was a five-member board, I, I missed that to get him back the information. Uh, also, I got an update. Robert Weeder, uh, he works with us. We, we pay uh, funds in also with Utah to use him to help us in D.C. So I had him update us on what he's been doing. Uh, over the past several months, we have worked to extend PILT payments. He's worked closely in tandem with Ryan Yates of NACO to put together strategies and implement them. That effort is about uh, to pay off six years ago with Democrats in power. They work closely with Majority Leader Reed to fully fund PILT after 27 years of partial funding. And they accomplished that by removing PILT from the Interior Appropriations Bill and making it mandatory spending, not unlike Social Security. Congress, at Senator Reed's direction, added PILT to the 2008 TARP bailout bill. He chose that legislative vehicle for four years, from 08 through 11, and then Congress reauthorized it twice, from 12 and 13, last year as part of the Transportation Bill reauthorization. So six years of mandatory spending at roughly four to $450 million per year and paid out of the offsets of other programs. For 2014, uh, Mr. Weeder developed a plan last fall to add seven years of mandatory full funding of PILF for the, in the continuing resolution, which combines all 12 appropriations into one package and worked closely with Speaker Boehner, uh, Whip McCarthy, uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers, and Greg Walden of Oregon. Each of these Westerners, as members of Boehner's leadership team, made it clear to the Speaker that PILF had to be funded. We supplies Walden and the speaker with you some maps I can give you showing that 78 percent of the benefits accrue to GOP House members. Thus, Boehner, in order to keep PILT as mandatory spending for counties, which we prefer, opted not to place PILT on the omnibus bill as a rider, but instead to place it in the upcoming Agriculture or Farm Bill conference report, which must soon be approved by both House and Senate. He expects that to happen in February at the latest, which will allow PILT checks to go to counties on schedule in June at full levels. Speaker Boehner must decide whether he wants to do only a one-year extension or a multi-year extension of PILT and pay for it by savings in agricultural spending with the proposed farm bill uh, slated to do. The initiative that we passed, along with uh, Mr. Weiner, uh, went to encourage Senator Flake to put it on a long-term PILT funding 
uh, fits nicely into the agenda they have now. Uh, Senator Flake is tight-fisted conservative and natural to help lead the charge because he can explain to other conservatives from non-public land states in the East why the federal government must pay counties. It is an ongoing obligation to assist in providing services over lands counties do not own and cannot tax. This is the basis for PILT and our well-thought-out way of bringing both a short and long-term solution for Mojave and other counties across the country. His relationship with these key players is a significant reason why we are on the verge of success and have a clear-cut forward-looking plan for the future of public lands. I also had a Quad State meeting. Uh, Re-elected chairman of Quad State, that was some big news there, but uh, last month uh, the chairman of Clark County, Nevada, County Commissioners sent out a letter proposing the counties of the Mojave region join together to seek delisting of desert tortoise. On advice of our attorney, we have advised that that strategy was likely futile. The executive director responded to the chairman and suggested we meet with the county and discuss our common concerns and develop a strategy that might work. To date, we have not heard a response, but the will be contacting Clark next week. For almost two years, Arizona Game and Fish has been slowly getting to the point of getting out invitation letters to counties regarding membership on the Arizona Interagency Desert Tortoise Team. County membership was okayed a year ago by the other federal and state agencies. The team will be charged with it to develop a con conservation strategy for the Sonoran Tortoise, which, if in place, might avoid Fish and Wildlife Service proceeding with listing under the endangered species. The executive director was charged to press Arizona Game and Fish to move ahead with forming the team and getting to work. The authority attorney spoke about recent December 2013 initiative by Western Governors Association called Critical Habitat Assessment Tool. The maps and data are generated by state fish and game departments. BLM and the Forest Service have agreed to use the data. The problem is that the data and maps tend to be opposite of what they are advertised as. They will discourage more development than they will lead the way forward. Further, none of them have publicly or have been publicly or peer reviewed. We need to look closely at any and all plans developed using the data and challenges outcomes and challenge the outcomes where appropriate. There's a great concern about reauthorization of PILT. that was not included in the omnibus appropriations bill, but is slated for the farm bill to be funded by savings and cuts in various ag programs. Action will likely take place in the next two weeks in both the House and Senate. <coughs> uh, Quarles, who is our attorney, uh, that he had finally secured agreement and commitment from the Fish and Wildlife Service Regional Director to hold a management oversight group meeting to review the outputs of the recovery implementation, implementation team's uh, work that was done last spring. The authority on behalf of all its members, counties, has spent the past year urging such a meeting since many of the proposal of biologists are uneconomical and impractical and the entire process needs management and executive oversight. Counties participated in the process, but the representatives were largely outvoted by the work group organization. Officially filed the dissents were relegated to back pages of the draft report. The meeting will likely be held in February or early March. This work involves the Mojave population of tortoises only. Uh, Hillier, our executive director, has been participating with the land, with the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. The steering committee met in mid-December and has continued to work on integrating climate change directives into science proposals. Most recently, a conservation blueprint has been developed in the South Atlantic and is being shown as the kind of work LCCs, there are 22 of them in all covering the U.S., could or should be doing. The fundamental problem is the blueprint ignored local governments and input from any representative of private land. The authority is actively participating so as to keep county concerns front and center and provide feedback to member counties. He also keeps staffs in Washington, D.C. informed as, so as to influence congressional oversight on the program, which is under direction of the Department of Interior. Here prepared an activities report reflecting 2013 work of the authority, and I have a copy. I have a report for the calendar year, but it's, it's kind of gone long so far, so I don't want to bore you with too much more. Uh, can you make that available? Yes, I can, I can give that to everybody. Um, and, and we also, I know some of us were down there for the opening of the Senate and opening of the House and then the Governor's reception, so those are the 
major things we covered. Okay. Thank you, Supervisor Johnson, for keeping us up to date and for working behind the scenes to um, make sure that we secure our PILT money, which is very important. So thank you very much. Um, I just have an announcement that tonight uh, at 6 o'clock right here in this auditorium, our Congressman Paul Gosar is going to be having a town hall where everybody is invited and he'll be taking questions and I believe being, he'll do a presentation that he does that will explain what's going on in Washington. I encourage everyone to attend. It will be streamed live and also it's on Suddenlink channel 130 and on UHF um, 36 in Kingman and Bullhead and UHF Station 23 in Lake Havasu City, and it will also be recorded. So if you can't come tonight or watch tonight, you can watch it at your leisure from our website at any time. Anyone else have any reports? Supervisors? Not on my end. Okay, do we have a county administrator's report? Uh, good morning, Madam Chairman. Uh, I have no report today. Thanks. Okay. And now I need a motion to approve the minutes for the September 13th, 2013 and September 16th, 2013 Board of Supervisor meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Next, our call to public. Those wishing to address the board at the call to public regarding matters not on the board agenda must fill out and submit to the clerk a call to the public request to speak form located in the back of the room prior to the meeting. I do not have any right here. Is there anybody here who wants to say something that's not on the agenda? Anybody? Okay, we'll, call to the, we'll close the call to the public. We're going to take a little um, privilege here and I'm going to move our agenda item number 25 to the front before we go to our consent agenda. And it says, it's discussion and possible action regarding the presentation of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, 213 Most Valued Partner MVP Award to Mojave County Housing Authority in partnership with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. And I'm going to hand that over to Supervisor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you've read what the plaque says. At this time, I'd like to ask Mr. Wolf to come forward and give a little explanation and then we'll bring our people forward and I'll present the block. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Chairman, Supervisor Johnson, members of the board. A little bit about this award, uh, Mojave County Housing Authority in partnership with the Veterans, Veterans Administration, and I have to stress our great partnership with the Veterans Administration, was nominated by the HUD Arizona Field Office for the Most Valued Partnership Award. We didn't do the write-up for it uh, that you have in your backup. Uh, HUD did it themselves, and uh, we had no idea that we're, we were even nominated for this award. So if someone's name is spelled incorrectly, don't get, don't get mad at me in the backup. Uh, the award recognizes exemplary practices in performance of the Veterans Administration Supportive Housing Program, also known as Bash. Part of the exemplary performance involved our, both Mojave County's and the Veterans Administration's work with one of our first uh, participants, Lucy, a 90-year-old homeless World War II veteran. Also, uh, Supervisor Johnson, who was chairman of the board at the time, uh, helped to raise over $1,300 in funds uh, for her furnishings and other needs when she moved uh, from homelessness into her new apartment. Uh, Dania Hurd, housing specialist senior's husband, Dennis and their son, even helped her move her things from the shed where she was living into her apartment on their own time. Uh, Jeremiah Jensen, uh, v Veterans Administration case manager, spent many additional hours helping Lucy in the transition. In fact, we did so well in our performance in getting the program going that HUD and the Veterans Administration awarded us funding in December for an additional 25 vouchers to help 25 more homeless veteran families. I would like to thank, thank the Mojave County Board of Supervisors for their continued support uh, of the Mojave County Housing Authority and the VASH program. I would like uh, especially to thank Mojave County staff and our Veterans Administration partners who put in all the hard work in the program, including 
helping out with the homeless surveys that we, we have to do annually that made this award possible. Um, I'd like to announce their names and invite them up uh, to come up and accept the award as a group. And I know Supervisor Johnson has also invited a uh, veterans group from Lake Havasu City. They're World War II veterans. And I remember they were also uh, involved in raising funds for Lucy. So um, at this time, from Mojave County, uh, Dania Hurd, Jennifer Birch, Jennifer Harper, and Tony Ambrose. And from the Veterans Administration, we have uh, Ed, Shear, Ed Shear, who who is the uh, Vash, HUD VASH manager who came all the way up here from Prescott, and Jeremiah Jensen. I would also like to thank uh, Marta Duran at the HUD field office and Timothy McCarthy, who I suspect wrote the actual nomination. Gentlemen. Commandant from Marine Corps League 77, McCoy, retired Marine, and Bud Watts, who is the commander of Disabled Veterans 27, and a Marine, and we have Ace Johnson, Army Air Corps, POW here. Would you take Okay, thank you very much, and thanks again to Supervisor Johnson for making that all happen. And now we are going to do the consent agenda. Items 5 through 21 will be considered as a group and acted upon by one motion minus any items pulled for discussion. Do we have any items that we'd like to pull? None on my end. Supervisor Johnson? No. No. Okay, I just want to take out number 13. Uh, Supervisor Watson, I have oh, I'm sorry. Pull. I'm sorry. Supervisor Watson. No, I have none to pull. Thank you. Okay, I apologize. Okay, I just, um, I just want to talk for a second about item number 13, so I'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve items 5 through 21 of the consent agenda, except for item 13. I'll second the motion. In favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. I just for a second, I, as I was going through, it, it occurred to me, and, and it's been mentioned that sometimes we'll take things out of the consent agenda and people are appreciative because sometimes they don't understand it. And I, I actually didn't kind of understand this, so I wanted it to be explained just a little. Um, it's to approve the disposal of unauctionable surplus property without cost to the county via recycling, recycling 
taken to an approved landfill or donated to a local charitable organization, whichever method is deemed in the best interest of Mojave County in accordance with ARS 11-251 and authorize county staff to sign all necessary and convenient documents on behalf of the county as a part of the disposal. And that sounds pretty straightforward and simple enough. I just wanted to ask, um, maybe Annie can come down here. How does the county decide which charitable organizations? Do, do they come forward? Do they bid? Do they just ask? What we do is we have a list of them in our um, central services, our warehouse area, and we kind of rotate. We go down through and we, we tell them what we have that's unauctionable and ask them if they're interested. And if they are, if they are interested, the only thing that we ask is that they come and pick them up because um, the procurement doc department doesn't have any delivery method. And a lot of times, depending on what it is, we get no's from a lot of them. It seems like um, ARC is the one that always will take whatever we have without questions asked and they'll always come and pick it up. But if anybody is interested in a char as a charitable organization in getting any of our surplus, if they would contact the procurement department, we will add them to our list. We'd be happy to. Okay. I, yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know that we do take great pains to make sure that all our surplus, that we get as much as we can for it and that it's disposed in a, in a, in a good way. Any questions? Supervisor Watson? No questions. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Motion? I move that we approve item 13 of the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Next, we're moving on to the regular agenda, and that's number 22. Discussion and possible action regarding the, to direct staff regarding real property known as Arnold Plaza, located at 301 and 303 Oak Street, Kingman, further identified as APN 303-08-151 and 15321, hold a new public auction in accordance with ARS 11-251, auctioning the property or at the appraised fair market value and expanding advertising for the auction process, or two, in accordance with ARS 11-251, uh, with unanimous consent of the Board of Supervisors, sell the property at less than fair market value to any other governmental entity or for a specific purpose to any charitable, social, or benevolent nonprofit organization incorporated or operating in this state, or three, authorize staff to re-roof and paint the property for future sale in hopes the market improves and approve budget funding for and not to exceed the amount of $200,000, or four, authorize staff to issue a, sol a solicitation for demolition services of the property and approve budget funding for, for it not to exceed an amount of $635,000. This was continued by the board at our November 18th, at their November 18th, 2013 and December 16th, 2013 meetings. Okay. I'll make a motion for discussion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, who are we gonna, is going to speak about this first? Discussion? Yeah, we're having a discussion. Anyone want, do you want to speak Well, to it? it seems like we've got a lot of choices here. And one of them I don't like at all. So I'm a little hesitant to. May I ask Supervisor Brotherton what the, is the choice that she doesn't like at all? <laughs> the, the one where it's $635,000. Oh, option number four, demolish? Uh -huh. Well, I don't like that one either. I, so. I really don't. So I'd like to take that out. Uh, you know, I really, and I've expressed this before, I really don't want to spend any money on that, on that building. But if we have to, to get rid of it, but I don't see anything wrong with us selling it at less than market value. This and is... In, in the condition that it's in. I agree with um, Supervisor Brotherton, if I could, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I've narrowed this list on item 22 to three options, um, and it's actually one of the options isn't shown here. Um, option one, as listed here, is to hold a new public auction and hope it sells. Um, option two is to, um, if we have a unanimous consent, uh, to essentially um, sell it for less than fair market value or even just give it away to someone because it seems like a bit of an albatross at the current time and that would be to another government agency or a charity. 
The third option is to do nothing with it and let it sit. And then we can reevaluate things when the market improves and someone wants a gently used <laughs> building and will pay fair market value and let time hopefully create the market for it. But I don't see, um, at least on my part, the desire to spend any public monies on this building. Just for a little background for those in the audience, this um, a couple of years ago, the last board approved the demolition and it was about $635,000, but when the new board came in and we reassessed it and reevaluated it, we believe that there are better alternatives and a few in, um, invest, investors did come forward and uh, wanted to bid on it, but there were some issues and there were some issues that I think are, are controllable, that we could work with, but right now we can't because our, kind of our hands are tied. Um, I am, I'm with the uh, two supervisors to my right that um, I don't wanna see any money go into this. It is a building, it's in the middle of Kingman, which is on the upswing, and I do believe that it will be worth, it will be a value in uh, the coming years. So um, I, uh, Anyone else want to discuss this? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, if I could please. Uh, I really believe that we, as Mojave County has a responsibility to each of its cities, whenever we have a county building uh, in such disrepair, that it becomes such an eyesore. And I do agree that a great amount of money should not be spent in trying to uh, rebuild or renovate the building. Obviously, the dem demolition costs are extreme. Uh, but I would like for us to take an action of some type, either a, a reauthorizing an auction, uh, at least to get some type of interest or someone to give us an, an idea of what they would be willing to spend for this, uh, for this building. Uh, oh. That's basically where I'm coming from. Okay, do you want to put that in the form of a motion? Yes, I would. Oh. I'd like to. Let's if I, if, okay, a bit, wait, Supervisor Watson, Supervisor if, Moss. If I can ask one question before that makes a, becomes a motion, because I think I detect something here which may be to our benefit, and this is for Bill, um, uh, our attorney, Mr. Ekstrom. Um, if we've had one option, one auction, and no bids were obtained, if we have a second and something similar occurs. Uh, would that be something, additional information we would give to the appraiser for determining the fair market value of that building? Madam Chair, Mr. Moss, I think if that happens, obviously it's an indication the property isn't worth what the appraised value is. You provide that information to the appraiser okay. and I like the effective value. Okay. I will um, um, now be quiet for a few moments so Mr. Supervisor Watson can make his motion. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. President Watson. I'd like to make a motion to... Uh, have staff put together a, a, another auction for the property and that uh, in that ability to put that uh, at auction that uh, the possibility of a new appraisal be based upon either uh, bids or no bids. Second. Okay. Discussion. <clears throat> Can you read me back the motion? <laughs> Half staff put another option for property for auction uh, with the possibility of new appraisal based upon that. Can staff tell me how many appraisals we've had on that building over the last few years? Madam Chair and Supervisor Johnson, um, at this point we've had two, the first one in 2007 and then the most recent one in 2013. And the, the recent one in 2013 gave the fair market value of 65,000. Thank you. <clears throat> That's all the questions okay. I have. Okay. All right, so we have a motion and we have a second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. Moving on, number 23. Discussion and possible action 
to approve the recommendation of the county administrator to appoint Bennett Bratley to the position of Economic Development Director, effective January 21st, 2014, at an annual salary of $67,500, which is at range 23 between steps three and four. I make a motion when we approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Number 24, discussion and possible action to approve the amendments to the county, Mojave County Rules of Order. I move, I've, um, if I could, Madam, Madam Chair, um, I move that we approve the amendments to the Mojave County Rules of Order. I reviewed them. It seems like they took into account all our suggestions from last year. Um, there was one thing that I noticed which I had not, we had not discussed, but I think that's more of a legal matter which had to do with the um, FCC and displaying of harsh language via written word that wouldn't, uh, might get the county in trouble if it was broadcast over the airways, and I had no problem with that. Okay, uh, I'd like to say something too. Uh, I want to thank the staff for putting this together. Um, we did make quite a, a lot, this new board made quite a lot of changes to the way we do business here. And um, in case no one noticed it last time, my assistant did, um, I choose, I had a discussion with Supervisor Johnson, and he informed me that up until the last maybe three or four years ago, uh, we never had to make a motion to discuss, that if a supervisor or someone puts something on the agenda, that they have a right to discuss it. And um, so I'm going to be, I'm not gonna be asking for motions to discuss anymore. Apparently that is my right as the chairman and that is what I'd like to do. Um, I think it's just uh, kind of a waste of time. Okay, and I think, I believe that's in there as well, that we made that, that uh, change. Okay, so there's a motion. I have a question. Sure. Supervisor Moss brought it up, but I'm not sure exactly how are we covering the way I read the, the changes because of FCC. We're not doing editing of, of um, broadcasts, are we? Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding we stream live. Or, Madam Chairman, Supervisor Johnson. Okay. Then, then how do we, how do we if, if somebody has something that could get us fined, how do we handle that? Madam Chairman, Supervisor. Madam Chairman, Supervisor Johnson. That's a good question. I, I would assume that uh, the law would apply. You know, if someone breaks the law, uh, all we're doing is really stating the obvious. And uh, I believe we, we, uh, it was our intent to actually state that requirement um, as it was written in the, in, the, in the law. I guess, Madam Chair, so we're covered enough because it says they've removed a lot of restrictions that, the, the, that were in place before. So how do people know they can't come up and be on television with some offensive shirt on or something if we're allowing them to wear them everywhere else? I guess that's 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 the, that's the problem I have with with how we've done it. I, I agree with everything you have there, but there should be some something to say. No, you will not come up in front of the board with something that could get us fined. Can I make a suggestion on our call to public notices? The fill, the forms they fill out. Do we don't don't we have something that says that we used to? I, I believe the um, the revised rules of order states that, already states that they cannot have an offensive shirt on because of that FCC restriction. They, we, we say they have to wear a shirt and shoes, they have to be appropriately attired, they and they can't wear an offensive shirt. I also believe that the attachments had something like, um, along those lines. Unfortunately, my, the internet's down, so I can't pull up the attachments <laughs> to look at them, but I do believe I saw something along those lines in them. Um, is we don't have any uh, delay mechanism when we stream live, do we, Nathan? Uh, but we do have something on the yellow call to public form that we don't. Do you think, think that's something we should put on when they fill out the form that they will not be allowed up with? Madam Chairman, uh, supervisors, I believe that's a good idea, uh, and we can certainly include it. And I, uh, the language that was included it appears that it would allow the county the ability to address somebody coming in if we believe that it was a, uh, that they were wearing something offensive. I don't believe we have a mechanism that would uh, 
that's available to us that would prevent somebody from being offensive over the over the airwaves, you know, verbally offensive. So um, I'm I'm not sure we we as staff certainly can look into that and see if there's anything that we can do. But um, there's certain things that uh, are difficult to prevent with our the technology that we use right now and if, the live streaming. If I could, Madam Chair, yes. I looked at the call the public form and the request to speak form, and they both reference appropriate clothing, which is not disruptive of the proceeding. And um, there's two things that occur to me. Um, number one is if we as a group, I mean, there's many county employees in here, and we see someone walk to the door that says blankety blankety blank, because we're looking at the George Carlin seven deadly words is what we're, we're looking at here, that we're not allowed to broadcast. Uh, we know before that person gets to the podium, or at least we should, that he's wearing that shirt and we can take steps to prevent that or have them cover it up or something of that nature. <laughs> the second thought that I have is it's the law. We are saying follow the law. We'll do our best to follow the law. But there's this inherent danger in every single live broadcast, not just us. When Good Morning America is out there in the crowd passing the microphone around or whatever, um, or you're having a presidential debate, or you have the TV5 you know, live, that stuff happens, and you have to be aware. And the, if it's, some people may, if they're really desperate to use one of the seven bad words on TV, they're going to do it. <laughs> no matter what we say, they'll come up with a perfectly normal shirt, and then as they're talking, they'll whip the shirt off, and they'll have something scrawled across their chest. So I think we're getting worked up about nothing that we can really truly prevent. We have the rules. The rules are clear. If they violate the rules, we'll deal with them at that right. time. And you know, we addressed all of this when we went through them when we first um, became a new board. And I trust the citizens of Mojave County. I'd rather err on the side of freedom. Um, that's what we decided to do as a board. And we, so far, so good. And as someone who watches a lot of television, it's hard to believe that yeah, there's anything that they're saying no to anymore. Uh, but I don't foresee that happening. And they, as Supervisor Moss said, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Thank you. Is there any? Oh, Nathan. I, I think I made a motion, but I don't know if it's been seconded or not. I'll second okay. the motion. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. We did number 25, so we're off to nine, number 26, discussion and possible action requiring all nonprofit <laughs> special event liquor license recipients to report back to the Board of Supervisors at the first meeting after their event to show proof that they have received at least the 25% of the gross revenues as provided by ARS 4-203-.02. Uh, 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 I believe we have someone couple of people who want to speak to this. Is there a Mr. Joseph Klein here? Mr. Klein? Please state your name and address for the record. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joseph Klein. I live at 4405 North Baker Drive, Kingman, Arizona, 86409. Okay, uh, I believe the reason I'm here speaking on this is I believe this was put on the agenda in regards to a specific promoter who has an upcoming event that has a habit of not paying his bills. So I'm definitely in favor on following up on these promoters to make sure they are doing what they're supposed to do before they can get a permit to do another event. I am a victim of this particular promoter. I'm holding on to a $1,500 check that I cannot cash. I provided services for them and didn't get paid. So I would imagine there's probably the nonprofit organizations out there that didn't get paid also. Um, so. May? It, you, no, go ahead. Um, I have two questions for the gentleman. Um, the first uh, question is uh, what nonprofit organization are you affiliated with? I am not a nonprofit organization, I am a for profit business that was hired to bribe, provide services for this promoter. Okay, and what, what nonprofit was the promoter associated with then? Uh, I'm not positive. I, uh, the, 
I think it was the Guardian Light Christian School or something like that. Because because what I'm hearing is it's the there's the non there's the vendors such as yourselves, there's the promoter, and then there's a the nonprofit organization. Because I believe I support Supervisor Johnson on this issue because I've heard, I've seen it happen before, mm -hmm. and the nonprofits have also been the victim because they haven't been paid <laughs> their 25 percent. So it's the, and the promoters are the problem, and or sometimes are the problem. My second question is: Have you turned that check over to Mojave County's bad check department? Because I think they're right down the hall <laughs> in order to have them pursue collection on your behalf. That's, okay. that's probably where I'm heading next. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Moss, could I say something? Is, is our, wait, are you Wally Knox? No. Oh, okay, well, look, can we? I'm just a nonprofit organization. Okay, so. can we, we need to do this in, in order, so you have your say it when we're done with the people who have signed up, okay? Oh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. And next, Mr. Wally Knox. Good morning, my name is Wally Knox and I reside at uh, 355 Fox Point Lane in Lake Havasu City, Arizona, 86406. I, um, like my partner Joe, are also a, a victim of this promoter. Um, we've done his events for the last three years and I'm also holding a, a check for the last eight months that's not <coughs> cashable. I was initially um, contacted by Floriana, um, who's here also uh, representing the, um, 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 the charity, uh, about her not being receiving the proceeds from these events from this particular promoter. And she asked me to come and speak about uh, our experiences dealing with this gentleman and, and um, <clears throat> Last year in particular, we had to threaten to shut down the event on the last day to pull the plug on the production, which we do the stage, sound, and lights, in order to get paid. And we did this other event in May, which is the check I'm holding and my partner Joe is holding from last year, eight months ago. Um, I know that's not <clears throat> anything you have anything to do with or can do anything about, but it just shows that this is the pattern of behavior of this particular gentleman and, and his event that he puts on. So uh, we just wanted to come and, and present the fact that we believe this um, <clears throat> needs to be re regulated more and these charities need to receive their proceeds. It's very inappropriate that these, they're not being paid what there's, you know, these, for these liquor licenses specifically for the events. Because then we know they're generating huge amounts of cash and they're not going to the right appropriate uh, um, charities. So anyway, thank you for listening to us. Yeah. Okay, is there anyone else who'd like to speak who didn't sign up? That would be you. My name is Floriana Hanna, and I am the charity Guiding Light Christian Educational Center in Lake Havasu, and I apologize, I didn't realize I had to sign up. So, Can you state your address, please? 220 Mescal Lane, Lake Havasu City, Arizona, 26403. And um, the charity uh, Rockabilly had uh, contacted us as being the nonprofit to receive the 25% <coughs> proceeds from the liquor license which was held in February of last year 2013. I know he is advertising now for the upcoming one that will be coming this February. Um, we have not been able to find out what charity has now been chosen to go through the same thing. Um, I know that Chip Romer who is the, um, I think he's with Budweiser, is um, not very happy about what's happening because that's part of those proceeds that come from those liquor areas, um, which was, is the upcoming one. Last year was PAPS. I have not been able to find out how much proceeds were, or PAPS were sold through that time. Um, I know Mark Talley, who, who was in charge of the skate park, unfortunately had a terrible accident and is unable to be here, but he was one of the others that had um, an issue several years back because of the skate park. 
again with the same organization. So we don't know where that puts us. Um, Guiding Light is out of a lot of revenue due to this organization. It was to be used for scholarship monies for students uh, to attend the school. So, May I ask a question? So just so we get this straight, and I know that we do this um, in the nonprofits I'm involved in, so uh, a promoter comes to town and asks a nonprofit to sell liquor because, or food handling because they already have all the permits and licenses and there's an agreement between the promoter and the nonprofit that the nonprofit gets a percentage of the money and um, this didn't happen in this case. Is this something that happens often or is this just this specific promoter? Um, I have not been involved before, so I can't really speak for, but it sounds like the past five years of this Rockabilly event, I don't know if anybody received any proceeds from it for the past five years. It, uh, Madam Chair, yes, if, if I may. Um, <clears throat> put this on the agenda. I, I thought that the previous board had brought this up that we would have nonprofits come back to us to to ensure that they were getting their money. A lot of them, this would be their first time doing it or second time, whatever they're doing. State law says they will receive 25%. So, and the liquor license is in their name. What promoters, not just this one, a lot of promoters do, they take the liquor license, they, they do with it as, the, as they wish. Um, the nonprofit is responsible for that liquor license and everything that goes on. So they, they should keep it in their possession. Let's say they bring in $10,000 selling alcohol. 2500 is theirs, not after, after paying expenses or anything else. What happens is the promoters will collect the cash from the nonprofits and then say, well, you know, we lost money or we only made $5 and you're not getting anything. I, I think this is a way to protect our, our nonprofits to make sure they get the money. Uh, a lot of businesses are, or promoters are using this to make a considerable amount of money with really no tax revenues at all going into effect so if the anyway I, I thought we'd had that previous board but obviously it wasn't so I brought it up to see if this board would want on all the permits that we give to say we would request that if you're we're gonna sign off on your liquor license you will come back to report to us that you did get the 25 percent and Supervisor Johnson, what would that reporting look like? Would it be a, a piece of paper or, or they come before the board or, or? I would think they could come before the board or they could give us a statement, you know, with, with some kind of not um, notary or something saying, I mean, we don't force them to come up here to tell us, but so that we're sure that they did receive their money. Because after it's over, just like people in the audience today are holding paper that's, that's no good and, and a nonprofit, um, they're raising money through this liquor license probably because they're not wealthy to begin with so they don't have money to you know hire an attorney um, so I would think just you know we could have it I, I guess the motion could be to have staff draft up um, a proposal for us to approve on how it could be handled at the you know when a liquor license comes through and at the same time I think we need to strengthen our uh, with the state on liquor licenses because I know in the Havasu area the state park has been issuing uh, the state has been issuing liquor licenses in the state park which come under our jurisdiction without having to sign off of the sheriff or the board of supervisors hmm. I've issued quite a few is, is this a problem that we've dealt had to deal with before yes I have I've dealt with you quite have a few in times. Yeah, if I could madam chair um, are we looking to put teeth in this? So let's say, um, let's say our Rotary Club comes back and says we got sucked in with a promoter, which almost happened a few years ago, but one of our members did some due diligence and checked into him in Colorado, and so we dodged a bullet. Um, but, and we, we come back to the board and we say, yeah, we got the special events liquor license from you. Thank you very much. We had thousands of people there, and at the end of the day, we got zero dollars. What do we do then? I mean, do we look at the, do we say to Bill, can you talk to um, the county attorney, Matt Smith, and pursue this person for prosecution? Is there teeth under the state law that we could use, or what would we do? Or do we, do we pass as an ordinance and make it a violation of county law? Because once I f we find one of these people who are doing this, like, this rockabilly thing, I think we need to make a few examples so they know not to come to Mojave County and engage in this sort of behavior. I, I, I agree with Supervisor Moss, and I think that would be something we could put over. I, I think by 
I'm not sure that the nonprofits understand that that the liquor license is theirs, it should be kept with them, and that when the money comes in, they're collecting it, say, the beer gardens. What these promoters have been doing is coming in and taking the money. No, they should collect the money and then take their 25%, and then it shouldn't go away. So I think once we tell them exactly what their rights are, and then if we do have a problem that something comes up, then we can look towards Mr. Ekstrom to uh, do his duty and prosecute people. Because I could see the scene where we give them that information and the club president and the club board knows, but at 9.30 at night, everyone's at home. They have one last lone volunteer who's dedicated but didn't see the paperwork. The promoter swings on by, picks up the money box, and vanishes, never to be seen again. <laughs> so. but, but with this situation, this is a, an event that's recurring. So if these issues had been brought to our attention, how could they have been keep getting their permits to have these events? This, this is the first year for me, so I was not aware. Um, I evidently, I didn't do my due diligence <laughs> because I wasn't aware of it. And I was not aware, as, as uh, Mr. Johnson had said, about that I hold that liquor license. I read it, it sounded like that, but I was like, that didn't quite make a whole lot of sense to me. So I was instructed to get it notarized, bring it in, handed it to the person in charge of the rockabilly. From then on, and I had a lot of my vol uh, volunteers come in from my staff that worked it. They watched the amount of money that came through those booths, but we never saw a penny the, of it. The only thing I have a little bit of an issue with is I just want to make sure we're not sort of getting in between, you know, agreements like this, the gentleman that came up before. I mean, that's a private, you know, they, they have their means and their um, avenues for recourse. And I, I, don't, I just don't want the county to sort of get more involved in that than they need to. Right, Madam Chair. I think where, where part of it comes from is, it's like we don't know, it's, it's say, say uh, Mr. Moss was the promoter on all these, but he uses the Guiding Light Church, and the next time he uses the Marine Corps League, and then he, so we don't know that who's behind this doing it. So maybe, I don't know if there's a way we could say, who are you doing it for? But a lot of times, and like the vendors who are here, and so I think they were just, um, reinforcing, I can't put words in their mouth, the fact that they didn't get paid, the nonprofit didn't get paid, but when it comes out, it's like, well, the Guiding Light Church got this uh, liquor license, so nobody wants to sue because they think it's the Guiding Light Church, which in fact, there's, you know, right. Oz in the background pulling the strings, just keeps <laughs> coming back year after year, parking money. Okay, so we have a, a motion to, um, to instruct staff to come up with something to... Um, we haven't had the motion yet, I don't um, know. If you well, like, you I'll take a stab at it, or, or Supervisor Johnson can, either way. Okay. Go right ahead, Mr. Monk. Okay, Monk. thank you, Supervisor. I move that we discuss, or that we direct staff to bring back to the board um, at our next regular meeting um, a proposed um, form and potential ordinance that requires all nonprofit special event liquor license recipients to report back to the Board of Supervisors at the first meeting after their event to show proof that they have received at least 25% of the gross revenues as provided by ARS Section 4-203.02 um, for purposes of ensuring that promoters and other persons do not take advantage of Mojave County nonprofits. I second the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. Let's read Gina one. Excuse me? Oh. Morning, Chairman, members of, of the board. I just wanted to make a statement for these uh, promoters that come in. I've been with Kiwanis Powerhouse for like 20 years now. And I just want to say that we have never walked away without the money that was due us. So just for the, this is a rarity that this certain organization came in and took advantage. So just wanted to let you know. Name. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, Regina, would you come in for the record, state your name? Oh. Regina Musumici, <laughs> 3697 Dakota Road, Kingman, Arizona. And thank you so much for saying that because I know that's been, in the short time I've been involved with Rotary, I know that's been our experience Absolutely. that we, we yeah. always get paid. And, and we have I, a bunch of lawyers in Rotary. <laughs> so like well, if I could, the reason why we get paid is because we pull a special events liquor license. We run the event ourselves, and there's no third party, no intervening third party who we run things through. 
Um, for example, of a type of event would be very easy for a promoter to take advantage of a nonprofit is they put it together, we serve the beer, but the beer isn't a cash exchange, it's a ticket they get at the door. Right. So the promoter never, like I see some beer festivals in Prescott are done that way. So the Rotary and the Quantities will never see a nickel, a dollars, because they get reimbursed from the five or six microbreweries who are competing based upon the ticket turn in. Right. So well, I hope that the nonprofits do a little bit more research and, and make sure that they're, um, they're taken care of. And yeah. Okay, so we're all done with that one. On to number 27, discussion and possible action to direct the county administrator and other county staff to communicate and explore with the city of Lake Havasu and other interested third persons entities, the parameters, including cost, scope, time frames, and other associated issues with developing the Horizon 6 channel area into non-motorized trails and integrating those trails into the city of Lake Havasu city trail system for the recreation and economic benefit of Mojave County residents and then report back to the Mojave County Board of Supervisors for additional instructions, if any, before undertaking further actions. Uh, I do have some people signed up to speak to this. First up is Jane Riley. Good morning. My name is Jane Riley. I'm at 3620 Vega Drive in Lake Havasu City. Uh, Madam Chairman, fellow supervisors, I thank you for your time. I would like to uh, speak to the benefits of the proposed, proposed Horizon 6 Trail in conjunction with the Lake Havasu City Trail Plan. Every, even though the proposed Horizon 6 Trail is small in stature, it will provide a much needed safe and direct route across a busy residential area. As a hiker as well as an equestrian, the ability to access trails and BLM areas around our community is a huge advantage. My husband and I hike with the Lake Havasu hikers and many of the group would love to have better access to a variety of the local trails. And, and in the Horizon 6 area, you also have access to state lands and BLM lands just outside the area. That being said, I would like to point out how the proposed Horizon 6 Trail would be a key cross trail to the Lake Havasu City Trail Systems. Trails that could be accessed are the proposed Mockingbird Wash Trail, Powerline Trail, Shema Wavy Trail, and Belt Loop Trail. I do have a map here if you'd like to see it of, of um, really where the city is. Would you like me to drop it off or? Sure. I think we have a lot of this background material though. Thank you. So from the map, it, it, when I sat down and reviewed it, it's like, oh, well, this is, would make a good cross, cross trail going to these other trails. A great, the great thing about the Horizon 6 flood control project is that it's been completed, and there is a right-of-way already constructed. So the development of this trail would have minimal impact on the area at minimal cost. And I thank you for your time and consideration, and, and again, I think it's... Um, for hikers, it's a good way to get, get from point A to point B. Thank you. I have a question, Madam Chair. Sure. <laughs> the, these city trails you're talking about, they're proposed. They're not even miles from Horizon 6, right? I realize that they're just proposed, but I hike in the area, I ride my horse in the area, I also belong to the Havasu Four Wheelers, have worked with the BLM as far as doing GPS trail mapping. You know, the Havasu Four Wheelers have been doing that for the past six years. So I'm extremely familiar with the area. I know where the power line trail is proposed. I know where Shema Wavy Wash is. And what we're looking for is really a way to get from the more south side of where Mockingbird washes, because we see hikers in there all the time, to go directly across the residential area to, say, up to the Shema Wavy area, which is really in a direct line. It's granted there's no specific trail going all the way across, but it does act, enable us to get across the residential area. But, okay, you're talking about walking in washes because there is no. Chimma Wavy Wash Trail, nor Mockingbird right. Wash Trail. Right. And 
you say you live on Vegas, so you're quite a distance from there. So let's say you're going on your, your hiking or your horseback riding. <laughs> this, this trail is all it is you're talking about is a shortcut because there's BLM land and state land all around Horizon 6 that you can hike around or walk around. This is just a shortcut between um, one side of Donkey Acres and the other side. That's, and it cuts it off by what, a half mile? No, actually the trail is a half mile, but the, so yes, that enables us to, when I take my horse or I hike and have to go through, avoid people's private property to get to the other side, because I happen to have a horse on, on Blue Canyon and say I want to get to the other side of the city, I have to literally ride either up and around through a big shooting area, or I have to go more south towards the lake and wind through people's private property to get to the other side to ride with other people or hike with other people. So it's, it's a safety issue, I mean, because even if we stay on the roads, we have vehicles that are driving very fast, so I mean, you have, as a hiker, if I have a dog, and, and I meet many people with dogs that don't want to be on the, on the public street. So all we're saying is we just want to get from a safe way to get across the residential area. And it's not always safe to ride up to the north of it because there's shooting, there's people on ATVs and, and things like that. And sometimes it's, the trails are just less um, busy when we get across town or across Horizon 6. Right. Now you're, you're aware that this has been in front of the board before and was voted down and it's a liability issue for the county. Our flood control, we've, we've had staff look at this and decided that it's not a liability that uh, we're willing to take on. Well, some of the, the residents along the channel, because before the construction was finished, we were able to access on the edge and go across there because where the channel is built was our access wash to go across the area. So I've had residents there come up and ask me, uh, you know, if what's going to happen once the fencing goes up. So we've had to seek alternate routes, yes, the ones that we've used before, but when it takes you 20 minutes to get to, to the other side, when it would only take you five, and as far as what's been built, um, Mary Van Roy has, has all the information on that, as far as, you know, the legalities, I guess, or, the liabilities. Right, but from where the Mockingbird, or where our wash project is, if you were to continue riding up Blue Canyon or one of the other streets to the state land, it's what, a half mile? Well, there's very large hills going up. You're talking going up to where I call the shooting area right, right. at the top there. Um, it's, what, about a half mile, Mary? But it, you're talking some major hills going up and down. And I've ridden my horse up some of those and walked up them, but you just never know when a car is going to come over and run into you. I mean, it's, people just think it's, it's whoopsie hills for them to go faster on. Oh, yeah. that, so yeah. my safety, that's what I'm thinking of, my safety and other people in the area. Yes, you're talking about liability going on along the, the channel that you've built, because I can understand you know, what you're talking about there, but we're not talking about really needing that much space just to have safe passage. Okay. But, uh, I, and I guess with, with most people though, let's say they come down, or I, I know, the, especially with the horse riding group, they have a lot of, um, I don't know if members or not, but friends in the Kingman area and stuff, so they trailer their animals down, so most of those would trailer to state land and, and let their horses out there anyway, right? Yes, but I mean, I'm not gonna trail my horse a half a mile up the street just to that go further and get past the shooting area. But it's, um, yes, I do have people from Kingman that come down there and they park either at the facility I'm boarding at or on the street, and then we ride out from there. We don't necessarily park on Littlefinger to access the wash. That's all I have to Okay, let's, let's thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I don't, Ms. Madam Chair, I, I guess it's something if, if Supervisor Moss wants to bring a message forward that because this is to go to staff for discussion and to come back with something. Um, I'm not sure where we're going to go by. If I remember correctly, there were two issues. There was the liability issue and then there was the money issue. 
and the money issue, um, and Ms. Riley brought up minimal m money, but what actually is the cost if we were to do this for the county? Madam Chairman, I, I believe that's part of Supervisor Moss's motion is to direct staff to do some engineering. Now there's going to be some cost involved in tying up staff time to do that, but part of, if I understand this motion correctly, it's to explore uh, options and to uh, develop cost estimates and, and so forth and so on. Yeah. Um, when I, we addressed this issue back on May 6th, my motion was basically we're, we're allowing this trail to be used, put into production. It's going to be now a trail. Um, and this motion, though, is designed for more for reconnaissance. How much will it cost to put it into production? What are the liabilities? Who are our partners, if any? Who will it benefit? How can it be done, and how can it be done most cost-effectively? Then, and after we gather that information, bring it back to the board so we have a complete picture. Last May, we had a flood control project, which I tried to hijack into a trail project, and we were dealing with um, incomplete, not, I won't say incomplete information, but I suspect it was wild guesses because I put, and we put staff on the spot when it came to giving us numbers. This would allow us to bring concrete information back to the board so we can actually truly evaluate it from a cost-benefit analysis. So it's an information-seeking motion. Okay. We do have a few more people who want to speak to it, but please keep um, in mind that we have, you know, we've gone through this before and we understand, we've heard the um, arguments in favor of it. So, but you have, you're here, you want to speak, come on up. Mary? Thank you, Chairman Angius and Board of Supervisors. I'm Mary Van Roy. I live in Lake Havasu City at 4034 Blue Canyon Road, Lake Havasu, Arizona 86406. And we are um, the property owners that did sell one acre for this flood channel, so we do border on the flood channel. I just wanted to leave a map that when we've worked with BLM as a partner, to do the trails and it's actually right out of donkey acres so there's some question there the other thing is um, i have the original petitions that were signed by um, property owners and and trail enthusiasts and they each had the map attached the board all should have gotten the packet with uh, copies of all these um, petitions and i wanted to give you actually a copy of the original blank petition so you see the map that was drawn with the blue line for the proposed trail and I wanted to say that this is a wonderful opportunity to communicate and explore non-motorized trail along Horizon 6 flood channel we have many property owners and that butt right up to the channel and volunteers and we've worked with county and city before and with BLM so we would love to continue doing that um, also, Eric, who owns the house at 40, 40 Blue Canyon, has um, left messages where the county has not had a response yet, and he wants to buy that um, strip of land that's like an easement that would add to his property, and he calls that, he's in the real estate business, highest and best use. And he loves seeing us horse people come by, he loves watching the horses, and he's always allowed it. And when you say that channel, where the channel is now, that's been used by horses and hikers and, and everybody for ever since Horizon 6 was founded. So, and I can't say we've ever had liability issues. We border it and we never had liability issues. I have some pictures here of um, the site and Eric asked me to give you your, his name, address, phone number because he's very interested in buying that parcel of um, strip of land that's left over, the easement part. And um, when he does that, he says he'll take all the liability issues and he will, you know, cover whatever. He actually, on the pictures you'll see his motorhome parked below. I took the pictures from his backyard pool area. Oh. And then I also took pictures of um, the trail that you'll see that's fenced off now. And I also showed our acre. We have half of that property still left over. The county bought the whole acre because it wouldn't be usable to us as only a partial. And um, that's a beautiful staging area. We actually had someone from the equestrian area come. And then actually, let me go really fast. I have a flood control district letter. And I have the fencing, um, I have the picture. This is taken off the fence. They actually used horse fencing. And the big issue last time was that it was going to cost three or 400000 for a third fence if they wanted it to separate the trail from the channel from the border fencing. And actually, I think they did the whole project for about 100000 
And so an extra fence, and a lot of times maybe just moving a fence or allowing it, again, working together would be the answer. Then they have the house that's up for auction at 4039 Littlefinger, and that one they're going to be receiving money, and hopefully that would help pay for some fencing. Okay, and then Doris Bishop's um, property at 4037 Littlefinger, that's still, they have to settle with her. If I could, Madam Chair, if uh, we can ask staff to, um, if, if, this, if, assuming this motion is approved, to work with Ms. Van Roy and gather her documentation, because it might be better if they have the time to read it, as opposed to the brief dissertation right. that she's given. And can I give you these pictures and Eric's address so he can, because once you have the money from the sales of all these properties that were part of the channel, heck, we'd have money. We don't even need very much, because to put a third fence up at the, at the price that they paid for this horse fencing that they did put up, I would like to give you the pictures and then okay. if you. I've, and thank you very much for, you know, that was, the money aspect, when we spoke about it many months ago, was um, overwhelming, to say the least. And I, um, I like thinking of the private-public partnership and ways to do it. So I appreciate all your hard work. I know how much hard work you've done on this. Thank you, Chairman Angius. Angus. I appreciate all that you do. <laughs> and I would like to say, we don't have to have flood insurance anymore. I mean, our property values go up. Everybody who's below the channel, property values are much higher than they would have been. And it's buildable where it wasn't buildable before. So it's um, many millions of dollars was spent. It's a minimal, minimal cost to make it accessible well, that's, to the public. That's always the key. Minimal is, <laughs> we know, our definitions of minimal may be different. And we got lots but of volunteers. But I want to say that um, in Supervisor Brotherton's district, there was a similar there was a similar situation, and the private sector and the, and the citizens worked together for mm -hmm. no cost to the county. Right. And so we'll, we'll be looking at all of this. Um, and we have someone else who wants to speak. Of a, just, does anybody else still want to speak to this? Yes, okay. Uh, Chairman Angus, if I could have a moment. Oh, yes, please. Supervisor Watson. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe I support the motion. But I do have a concern about this horse gate that's in the packet. Uh, I've never seen one of those, and I would have some real caution in uh, putting one of those in without first seeing an example of one. Uh, it just appears to me that there's, that's a wreck looking for a, happen, <clears throat> for a place to happen. Okay, did you get that about his, uh, Supervisor Watson's concerns? Okay, your name please. I'm Delbert Campbell, D.L. Campbell. I'm out of Lake Havasu City, uh, 86403. I've uh, been a resident of Havasu since it started. And uh, the project in Horizon 6, that's a half a square mile that was divided into one acre lots. Approximately 180 lots are in that subdivision. And this trail is much needed up there. That's a very dangerous area to ride a horse in. There's hardly any shoulder at all on these roads. The hills are so steep that your horses will slip on the asphalt if you try to ride on the road. And there is uh, quite a bit of traffic up there. The north end of the property is used as a gun range. And there's constant rapid fire up in the wash above there. The safe area is at the end of this trail, which I don't know if that trail goes all the way through the public lands into the state section up there or not, but it gets real close. Uh, I, the cost to me to put an inside fence in there should be fairly minimal. You wouldn't need a big fence like they put on the outside. It'd just be like, a, like they're putting along the highway out there to keep the burrows from getting on the road and the liability I see if it was an equestrian trail there's a statute in Arizona that prohibits you from suing if you get hurt on a horse I have that statute posted at the rodeo grounds I'm actually the president of the Friends of the Fair that uh, promotes our our rodeo grounds in Lake Havasu and this this project is needed and it's a good site for it and i think the, I, the county doesn't have any footprint in lake havasu they don't want to have a single park there or anything at all that i know of so i think you need to to give us something down there thank you 
Okay, thank you. And Janet Deaver. Madam Chair and the Board, thank you very much. My name is Janet Deaver, 375 London Bridge Road, number 68, Lake Havasu City, 86403. And we are asking, as Mr. Campbell said, for your assistance in having safe access restored for a non-motorized recreational trail, which the present fencing precludes. Some of the fencing went a little further than it probably needed to, or we would, could have gotten around it. It is very easy to come up with the negative, but we feel with a public and governmental partnership that we can find solutions that are minimally expensive. We certainly have one citizen here who has helped with many, many things in the public sector. The equine law, Mr. Campbell talked about, there is a state statute which recognizes that equine activities are inherently dangerous and that public or private individuals cannot be held liable. We would love to find those who will dwell on the positive and help with it, not only improving our safety on Horizon 6, but the total recreation experience. I have a packet of information on a being built trail around Maricopa County, 375 miles of private public cooperation, plenty of horse gates, um, Supervisor Watson, that you could look at that we have pictures of. I'm a horseback rider and have been through many public lands with proper horse gates to keep out motorized vehicles and to make safe access for hikers and for equestrians. We want to start a conversation. We don't want to say blankly that the liability, which the county attorney would certainly know more about, but we feel that we have participated in government areas and that the liabilities can be controlled very nicely. But we thank you for your hearing us. We thank you for your possible assistance in helping us connect with the trail system in the city. We have a lot of looking and a lot of asking questions to do, but please consider it. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else who wants to speak to this? I have no one else signed up. Okay, motion. Um, Madam Chairman, I'd like to move that we direct the county administrator and other county staff to communicate and explore with the city of Lake Havasu and other interested third persons or entities the parameters including cost, scope, time frames, and other associated issues with developing the Horizon 6 channel into a non-motorized trail and integrating those trails into the city of Lake Havasu's trail system for the recreation and economic benefit of Mojave County residents and then report back to the Mojave County Board of Supervisors for additional instructions, if any, before undertaking further action. Essentially, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm looking for information. Second. And I'll second that motion. Okay. I have a question. <clears throat> why would this just be non-motorized? I mean, why are we, why are we well, separating out a portion of our field? Well, part of it is the, um, uh, is the safety issue here, because if we've, we've already have motorized access, based upon your comments to the first speaker, um, to the BLM areas, that we don't really need to get motorized access out that direction. And if we can get the horses off the roads and off the very steep hills where traffic's going by, I think that'd be to the, public, the benefit of the public safety. Um, secondly, there's an economic issue here, and this is a tentative idea is to expand uh, Mojave County's trail system. And when I say Mojave County, I'm talking about government, private, public, whatever, um, what's out available out there, because these things could be used for events. Um, don't want to use the word promoter, came up bad a few minutes, looking at close. But there are many, many events which occur and which are attracted to communities that have expansive trail systems, whether it's triathlons, marathons, bicycling racing, all that kind of stuff. So keeping trails for pedestrians, for horses, for bicyclists 
and dedicating it to those, those purposes, I think, serves a very important public safety and economic benefit to the community. I don't want my children, for example, walking along those trail system with me, knowing that some 17-year-old on a souped-up quad <laughs> may be coming down the road at high speed. I guess, uh, and then to advise the board to just remind them that the money everybody keeps talking about is flood control money. Anything that's sold or uh, paid down there needs to go back into the flood control because that's a countywide tax, so yeah. we can't just randomly use that money for something that's not flood control. And when it comes to this motion, the purpose is not to say how much it will cost, that's be the investigation that comes back to us, or where the monies will come from because that would take some discussion. It's just to bring, this is a plan, a cost-effective plan, this is how much it's cost, do we go to the next step after that or not? I have a question. The easement that was discussed that um, the gentleman offered to buy, is that something that we do? Is that uh, something that occurs often or is it, it would be unusual? Madam Chairman, I'd have to see what easement he's talking about. I, I have no idea, but uh, uh, there is an area along the side of the channel that's necessary for maintenance and access. And if that's what they're talking about, it would be okay. not in the best well, interest this, of the county. That's part to of this this information that we're mm -hmm. involved. Okay, and, and Madam Chair, we, we we moved the the channel to make the best use and to take the least amount of property from residents out there, where before it was a tremendous amount of land that was going to have to be uh, taken into the county system. So we got the minimal amount that we could to to put the project in. Okay, we have we have a motion. And I believe we have a second, correct, Supervisor Watson? That is correct. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. 28, sitting as Board of Directors for the Mojave County Library District, discussion and possible action to approve expansion and relocation of South Mojave Valley Library located at 5744 Highway 95, Mojave Valley, Arizona, for a four-year renewable lease that will include tenant improvements to be completed by the owner as required by applicable county codes for public library operations with the sole option of the county to renew thereafter in one-year increments and further approve allocation of $150,000 for one time and additional FY14 operating costs for additional staffing, equipment, utilities, and building functional improvements upon execution of a future lease with costs resulting from this relocation and expansion expansion funded by the Library Contingency Fund. I have a couple of people signed up. First, Mr. Jim Roundtree. You want to come up and speak? speak? And Madam Chair and Board, my name is Jim Roundtree. I uh, reside at uh, 2154 Pescador Drive, Mojave, uh, Mojave Valley, Arizona. I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm the realtor that's uh, working with the county to get, uh, get the library in, and I, I'm representing the, not representing, but working with the, with the owner of the property to get it. And I'm primarily here just to answer questions. Uh, I know the the building is well suited uh, for a library, and uh, it's not going to cost a lot, of, a lot of money to put it in. So, anyhow, any questions? Any questions? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Next up, we have Riley Fry. Madam Chair, Supervisors, uh, Mr. Hendricks and staff, thank you for considering this. Um, this is an exciting opportunity, I think, for the community of Fort Mojave. I reside there. Um, I'm also the superintendent of Colorado River Union High School District. My office is in that facility. Uh, we have a, a school in that facility as well. Um, and I'm also the superintendent of Bullhead City Elementary School District, and uh, there's just a short distance from our district office there. There's a beautiful facility that you folks built a few years ago, and it's something that I'm really proud of. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I was listening to the radio, and a, and a gentleman on the radio uh, asked um, a, a profound question. He says, what have we learned from this great recession? And as I pondered that uh, from my own perspective, 
as a school administrator, um, I think one of the things that I've taken away from this experience of, of uh, downsizing, if you will, is that really it's economies of scale and uh, synergy that gets us through these times and that makes us better coming out. Um, I was actually working on the, the district office when we were moving the, the high school district over there, and a gentleman stopped by and said, hey, what are you building there? And I said, uh, we're doing a, a school district office and, a, and an online school. And the guy said, dang, I wish it was a taco shop. <laughs> you, you know, I think that uh, a lot of the county is that way. You know, everybody's looking for a Maverick and an Applebee's on the corner. But the reality is uh, we, um, who, ser who serve the public, really need to be looking forward to the future of our communities. And libraries uh, specifically are a huge attraction. In my neighborhood, and I'm only a couple of blocks from that facility, um, in my neighborhood, the vast majority of those people travel uh, to the library either in Bullhead City, and, and some of us even go over to Laughlin to the, to the library there. So a, a facility where we're, we're working together, the schools and the library district, uh, only makes sense for the people in the area, the, uh, the opportunity to double the space, um, as well as the synergy that's created in forming IGAs between the district and the county, um, provide opportunities that are otherwise just unachievable by ourselves. Um, you know, I look at, it, for example, we, we put 100 grand or so into infrastructure um, and getting fiber optic into the building. Um, we have a, a phenomenal network. We have the security built in there. Um, all of those things we could work with, but especially the meeting space. Um, our, on our online school is in one, one wing, um, immediately adjacent is uh, the governing boardroom. Uh, all of those things would be uh, accessible and usable for, for the public and um, we could easily make those things happen and, and otherwise there is no space in Fort Mojave for those things to occur. So I thank you for, this, for considering this and, uh, and hope to see that happen in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for me? I have a question, Madam Chair, I guess. Do you plan on parting with the county? Is there money involved? Have you met with your board to offset any costs that we have with the change of this? Um, I, our governing board has not considered it. When we moved to the building, we expressed to the governing board there that it was our intention to try to make that entire facility uh, government office space. We had hoped uh, we'd hoped to land uh, Supervisor Moss in there, but he went downstream a little. So, but um, you know, the idea I think that our board would be amenable to anything that's going to be good for our schools, um, but has not been uh, addressed specifically in the form of contributions. Thank you. I have seen your online, um, and for those of you who don't know, it's for um, at-risk students or students who can't, for whatever reasons, be part of a traditional classroom, and um, it, it seems to work really well. It's been your experience so far? Yes, uh, we're less than a year old, 70 students attend there full time, we have 200 um, that are attending part time and a huge waiting list to get there. We, we anticipate expanding again one more, um, one more uh, condo uh, there in the future as well. Is, are, is there anything you want to add? I would because it um, dovetails with Supervisor Johnson's uh, comment. I heard, I think I heard you say this, uh, Superintendent Fry, but the school district has, uh, has already made that building suitable for a library by getting that fiber optic line extended to the building, am I correct? Correct. And when it comes down to it, that was a huge chunk of money. And in today's day and age, computer and internet access is a very large percentage of library demand. So they've already, if we did do this um, proposal, they would have already have contributed significantly to making this facility suitable for a library. Um, how, how much has our library director been involved in this? I believe she's been the contact person with Superintendent Fry, but they would better answer that question is, than is myself. She here? Yes. Oh, right here. Madam Chair, members of the board, we have uh, made contact with Mr. Fry. They did, as he said, um, offer certain certain things. Uh, in the initial conversations were that we could use some of their computers and those kinds of things, but because of the differences in our policies, in our um, filtering softwares, in the way that it's used, in that their students need to be on their computers as much as they need to be on their computers to accomplish their goals, 
and for public um, libraries, we have limitations on how long people can be on the computers only if others are waiting. We felt that it would be too much of an issue of treating certain people one way and certain patrons another way, that we, it was my recommendation that those kinds of things be separated. Okay, and, and has there been any pu uh, public input into this? You know, I know that the library, the existing annex library out there in Mojave Valley is about five miles, what is it? N S south, south, right. Of Correct. the location that you want to move it to. Has there been any public input as to um, uh, the negatives that that might, for, for people who logistically not that I'm there. aware of. You no. haven't heard anything like no, that? No, How no. about the Friends of the Library? Have they been asked to be a part of this? Not that I'm aware. How yeah. about the advisory board? No, they've the not been included either. Oh, if, question, I, Madam Chair. if I could, Madam Chair. Okay, wait, let's okay. Oh. Johnson. Uh, I'm not quite understanding where you got the authority to go out and look at bringing these numbers to us. We don't have in our uh, capital improvement budget the building of another library. So what is, it's, why are you bringing this forward to us and how has it gotten this far where people are showing up talking about partnering with us without a vote of this board? That's what this is. Okay, so, uh, County Administrator. Madam Chairman, Supervisor Johnson, um, one of the things that I've tried to do is if a supervisor uh, has a desire or a wish, uh, I've made it clear that I'm going to uh, have my staff try to package, be problem solvers, try to package that desire or wish as best possible so that we can bring that forward to the Board of Supervisors so you all can make a business decision out of that. So anything that occurred uh, and any action by staff, whether it be procurement, uh, uh, public works, or the library has been through uh, me authorizing it. And if I could, Madam Chair, yes, please. Um, I am the board member who asked Mr. Hendricks to look into this issue. Um, I also point out when it comes to public comment, I've had two um, emails in the last day on it. One is from a Rich Kirkpatrick who wants the Mojave Library closed completely, doesn't believe in libraries and think they should go to Kingman. Um, and secondly, from Jim Roberts, who's a member of our transportation mm -hmm. board, who thinks moving it to Pinion Plaza, and he lives in that vicinity, is a brilliant idea. I will tell you that I have had many, many, many conversations about expanding the library and placing it in that location with residents in the Mojave Valley area, and they think it's an ideal location and they love it. It will not to attend the Mojave Valley Library already. You all, people already have to drive there. There's not a residential neighborhood built around it. I think what Supervisor Johnson, if I'm hearing this correctly, I think you're, the problem you have is with the process how we've gone about getting to where we are today. Maybe we didn't do some steps that, um, uh, this, that we right, should have done. Right, my concerns are whether, you know, whether you win a, win a vote or lose a vote doesn't make a difference to me, but um, before County Administrator uh, Hendrick starts having staff uh, expend funds, I think the board needs to sit as the board of directors of the library district and say, yes, this is something we want to do. I mean, especially something like this, which was never even in the capital improvement plans. And, and I mean, the, the building, and I'm not saying you brought it forward, we have procurement and everybody else, but isn't this building in foreclosure you're talking about? I, I believe that it is, but I would defer to um, I, Mr. Mr. Roundtree, Roundtree might better answer that question, Supervisor Johnson. I believe it's bank owned and it's already been in foreclosure. That's why the bank is working with us. Yeah, I guess, and, and, and Chairman Angus to go a little farther with, this is changing the whole way we do libraries. Right now we have three main libraries in the main cities. And now if we take a Mojave library and bring it to full time, you're gonna have Golden Shores, Mead View, everybody else wanting to go to full time. I, that, that's, a, that's a policy thing I think we should look at first before we get into this. I, that's just my opinion. If I could, Madam Chair. Uh, Fort Mojave, Mojave Valley, which does not include the Golden Shores area, those numbers aren't included. In 2010, had over 21,000 residents. 
and has grown since that time. The school, the classroom sizes are bigger, the, st the homes are filling in. It is approaching the size of Kingman. And to say that they're not entitled to ask their supervisor to bring the library issue to the board, I don't think is fair to the residents of that area. Right, and I have no problem bringing it forward. It's just bringing it forward before we get all this other work done to see if the board, you know, it goes with it or not. Just that's my question. Okay. Any other questions for our library director? Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, if I can, I don't hope I'm not cutting off conversation too soon, but I move that we um, approve the expansion and relocation of the South Mojave Library located at 5744 Highway 95, Mojave Valley, Arizona, for a four one-year renewable lease that will include tenant improvements to completed by the owner as required by applicable county codes for public library operations, with the sole option of the county renew thereafter in one-year increments and further approve allocation of $150,000 for a one-time and additional fiscal year 14 operating costs for additional staffing, equipment, utilities, building functional improvements upon execution of future lease with costs resulting from this reallocation and expansion funded by the Library Contingency Fund. I, I'd like, can I just say something as a discussion? I, I feel uncomfortable doing this because of the things that we haven't done yet, like, um, the public input and the friends of the library and everybody who historically has a say in it. Um, I think it's, um, I think it would be better to make sure that all our, all our ducks are in a row before we do something as um, unconventional as this, that everybody who feels they should have a say in it has their say in it. And, and that's, I think that's, for me, that's the piece that's missing. Well, I, I don't think this has been a secret. I mean, it's been published, uh, so it's been out there. I've been talking to everyone and all the civic organizations, or they've been approaching me about it. I've been getting emails about it. There's no hidden agenda here. And when it comes down to it, how else does it do this? Does he, is, does, do these things solely originate with the friends of the library or whoever, which is, by the way, is a remarkably good group. I mean, I think they're a great group. But they're, um, uh, when it comes down to it, I didn't believe, understand that we were supposed to consult well, with them well, but but prior the to this. Board. Okay. The advisory board, that's what they do. They're, they're, they're like the PNZ. I mean, they, they get these things and then they let us know. I just, I just don't want to, after the fact, get a lot of sure. blowback. Can I ask this question then um, from the superintendent, or super, I'm sorry, County Administrator Hendricks. Is this the function of the Community Lib Advisory Board? Madam Chairman, Supervisor Moss, um, you all act as a board of directors for the library. Um, they would be an advisory board uh, to you on, on different activities. How? However, um, you know, how you utilize any commission or board is up to the Board of Supervisors. And, um, you know, it was my understanding that uh, this was a process that was desired. And like I said, we tried to package it as best possible. And I think uh, what the board is doing right now is making a decision on whether we move forward with this particular uh, uh, plan to expand the library. You know, if it's the board's direction to go back and discuss this with the friends of the library, or whoever else you need to discuss it with, it's your choice. If the board decides that, uh, uh, that you believe that's not necessary and you want to go forward with it as is and as stated, you certainly have that authority. And there's another complicating factor here, Madam Chair, is our lease is automatically renewed on February 28th. And that happens each and every year. So it's a one-year lease. I believe it, the date is February 28th, in the existing location. So if we delay, we push it back another year is what it comes down to. And what is our lease payment now? I think it's $900, something like that. I'm not 100% sure. The library director would have that information. I, I'm just, I just feel very uncomfortable with this. It means the first time that this has been in front of us and now we're being asked to make a, a decision. Um, I, I oh, don't know. Let me ask it this way. Could we get an answer from the library advisory board um, before our next board meeting on this issue? 
Was that when? When did? How often are they scheduled to meet? Even. Madam Chair, Supervisor Moss, we do have a meeting scheduled next Monday. We did have an, a, an, an item regarding this library already uh, scheduled for the oh. agenda because we assumed that because we weren't able to consult with them prior that I at least needed to report back what may or may not have happened. Okay. So. Then um, with that understanding, I withdraw my original motion and I request that this item be brought back to our next meeting after consulting with the library advisory board and i have some information from one of them that she sent to me and i will be happy to share sure. that with you okay and i'll second supervisor motion okay so we have a motion and a second to bring back this um uh, issue on the next meeting yes after consultation with the library advisory board very good all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed no all right and our final item, 29, discussion and possible action, proven organizational change, reassigning the clerk of the board to the day-to-day -day supervision and oversight of the Mojave County Board of Supervisors, and hereby, hereby instruct the clerk of the board and the county administrator to communicate and cooperate in the performance of their respective duties. Motion. Uh, move to discuss. Second. My only purpose for bringing this back is several months ago, we moved the clerk of the board um, to the um, county administrator to deal with some administrative issues that we weren't able to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I believe it's sufficient time has passed, and I think that it's time that we bring our statutory employee directly back under our jurisdiction. Um, as far as discussion, Madam Chair, while this is agenda, shouldn't we have this? Can we carry this over to the next one where we can have an executive session to, if that's the uh, wish of the employee to discuss it? I, I, if if Miss Prince desires that, I'm perfectly have, fine with that. Is that something that you'd want to have? We, we could just, yeah, just okay. It. All right. So make a motion then to just continue this till next. Uh, um, make a motion to continue item 29 until such time as we um, have an executive session before the next meeting. Okay. We're at the next meeting. All right, and second. I'll second the motion. Very good. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. And with that, I believe our meeting is adjourned. I am going to frame you.